that didn't fire you up, I'm not sure you're alive this morning. <laughs> this morning, I want to uh, I want to I want to start a two week series at least. Um, in fact, it really is a continuation of the series that we already started. We've been talking about you know basically having a better year, and I want to sort of throw out the premise of this message, which is this: if we are going to have a better year in 2021, and we can. I don't care about COVID. I don't care about you know, the military's 10-year plan for COVID. I don't care about the government's two-year plan for COVID. I don't care about any of that. I don't know. I don't care if we have masks or if we have bubble wrap suit jumpsuits or if we have you know complete space suits. We can have a better year in 2021, and I believe there's one thing that's going to make that happen, and that is prayer. It's not because we are going to do something better. It's not because we are going to get better. It's that we have to get on our knees and begin to fight the battle that has been raging for years and years and years. I believe that if we want to have a better 2021, we need to, to begin to use our war rooms and we need to pray. We need to pray for those things that, that we need. We need to pray for those things that our family needs. We need to pray for the things that our church needs. We need to pray for the salvation of the people in our community, in Pickerington, in Reynoldsburg, in Columbus, in Lancaster, in Newark, in Hilliard, and all around, and even in our world. We need to pray. The fact is, is that God, for whatever reason, God's chosen to allow us to determine what he does sometimes. And that is done by two things, faith and prayer. He said, it's because of your faith that will happen. And the Bible clearly says, if you ask not, you will have not. He says, you don't, you don't have what you need often because you just aren't asking for it. And, you know, face it, God could do anything he wants, right? He could fix all of our problems without us ever having to ask, right? He could. Let's just kind of, you know, agree with that. Do you agree with that? God could fix every problem. He could make everything perfect. He could make our lives run so smoothly. But then what would we do? We would typically, we would typically ignore it. Because when things are running well, we typically kind of go on cruise control, right? You know, I don't have to work quite as hard. I can, you know, sit in front of the TV and relax a little more. You know, I don't need to press into God because there's no reason for me to do that. Now, that's wrong. But we do that sometimes. You know, we tend to do that even with our spouse in our family relationship. Sometimes when things are going well, you know, we tend to put all of our relationships on cruise control. That's how divorce happens. Because we put our relationship on cruise control, we focus on other things, and before you know it, our marriage relationship is crud and we separate. And so the same thing tends to happen with God. Now, he's always pressing in, but he's a gentleman. And he doesn't push himself on us. And so we have to press into him. And this, this whole message, if you don't get anything else out of the, the next you know, several minutes that we talk, I hope that you will get this, is that if you will pray more from this day forward, if you will pray more for your family, if you will pray more for the community, if you will pray more for your church, if you will pray more for your needs and the needs of our country, if you pray for our president, regardless of who he is and whether you believe in his abilities or not, doesn't matter. Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, Independent, doesn't matter. The fact is, is whoever's in power is in power. And the Bible says we are supposed to pray for our leaders. And if we will do that, we will have a better 2021. We will have. We will. Do you understand what I'm saying here? It's not that everything is going to go perfectly, but the first thing that's going to happen is as we pray more and commune more and connect more, our lives are going to get better, period. Do you understand? Because God is, he is the, the fix for everything. Every problem that you have, he is the fix for. There's nothing that's broken in your life that can't be improved by more of God. He fixes everything. And so therefore, our life is going to get better just having been on our knees. 
But in addition, God is going to answer prayers. And we're going to see victories where we didn't see victories before. And we're going to see motivation in areas that we didn't have it before. And we're going to see him as we commune and we connect with him. He is going to bring us in and line us up with his purpose. Because, you see, prayer isn't just about asking for things. Prayer is communication. We shouldn't even, we shouldn't even call it prayer. We should just call it talking with God. Not talking to God, but talking with God. If I only went to my spouse and talked at her all the time and never let her talk, she would get irritated with me. <laughs> Because that's not conversation. Maybe we should call it conversation with God. Right? That's what it is. And we communicate and we connect, but we have to give it time. And there's one thing I want you to take away from. I want, I want you to have this as a takeaway. And I want you to write it at the top of your notes. Go ahead and pull your notes out right now. And your outline that's in your program. And I want you to write at the top of your program, just at, even if it's the one word, time. This is going to take time. And that means you're going to have to stop doing some things that you typically did. Because face it, we all use all 24 hours of our day, don't we? And if you haven't been praying a lot up to this point, something's going to have to go. You can't just add, you know, the 25-hour 25, 25 day isn't going to come around anytime soon. So something's going to have to go. It, for some of us, it might just be a little TV time. For some of us, it might be... You know, a little computer time or Facebook time or Twitter time or whatever it is that you do with your time. For some of us, it's more serious. Maybe you'll have to give up a bowling league or whatever. For some of you, it might be, I have to work a little less. It might even be for some of us, we have to spend a little less time with our families. But face it, if we don't prioritize prayer, we're not going to see that increase. Prayer takes time. It's a relationship. That's why, you know, all the time we go up, we see these bumper stickers and t-shirts that says Christianity. It's a relationship, not a religion. The problem is, is we acknowledge that, but we don't put the time into the relationship. And therefore, our relationships are weak. And so realize that over the next couple weeks as we talk about prayer, what I'm challenging you is, is to give up some of these other things, that maybe some of the things that are more frivolous and aren't really helping you. And start spending some time. Make that sacrifice of time and give it to the Lord. And grow your relationship and see what happens. It's going to take time and it's going to take one other thing and that's faith. Because without faith, you're not going to do it. If you don't believe that God is going to answer, if you don't believe he's going to make your year better, if somehow I can't get this across to you and he doesn't get it across to you through me this morning and next week, you are not going to do it because you're not going to see any value. If we don't see value in something, we just tend to not do it. But when we see that there's value, we see that there could be, you know, but that, again, that's going to take a little faith. When we see the possibilities, we say, you know what? I'm going to do this. But, you know, starting something new, it's kind of like exercising or dieting, right? You know, have you ever like decided you were going to go on a diet and you've been eating like, you know, pizza and spaghetti and all those good things that you like and cheeseburgers and I'm trying to get a smattering so that maybe I'll hit some of you here, all of you, hopefully. But, you know, things that make your mouth water. You've been eating all those things and all of a sudden you think, man, I got to lose some weight, probably ought to go on a diet. But if you don't really see value in that, if you don't really want to lose that weight or get in better shape or whatever, what are you going to do? It's not going to go very well. You might diet for a day or two, then you're going to cheat a little bit and a little more before you know it, you're not dieting anymore. Or exercise. I remember back in the 1980s when I was in the military, I decided I wanted to run the London Marathon. And I didn't know how I was going to do this because I was in the Army. I didn't know how I was going to come up with the time. So I went to my first sergeant and I said, would it be okay if... Since I want to run the London Marathon, it's going to take a lot of time for me to run because I'm going to have to run about 9, 10 miles a day. And I don't have really time to do that because we're always going to the field. I, you know, our, my, my particular MOS took a lot of my time. And so could I get out of PT, which is you know, physical training, the, the, where, we all, where they all, in cadence, exercise, one, two, three, and they do you know, kind of silly things that don't even really do anything. I said, could I skip that if I will commit to running every day? He's like, man, I've never had anybody ask that. And theoretically, 
I shouldn't say yes, but he said, I'm going to trust you on this one. And then I even said, you know, hey, if, I, if somebody wants to run for me one day, would it be okay? Yeah, if you want to take somebody with you, that's fine. Until I find out that you're cheating. Let me tell you something. The hardest thing I ever did, because I had to start training in January. As you can see, now in Germany, it was much worse. For whatever reason, the climate that we were in, it almost always snowed. I mean, it was snowing all the time. And what, the first day that I ran, there was almost two feet of snow on the ground. And it was cold. And when I got back, I looked some, I mean, my shoes and, and were just soaked. My socks were soaked. I had long icicles. I wore one of those pile caps to cover my mouth because it was burning my lungs. And all you could see was, you know, whatever. And I had icicles coming down off of the bottom and off my nose. It was crazy. But let me tell you something. I had to really want to do that, to put in that kind of sacrifice. And then to get up early. If anybody knows me well, I am not a morning person. I hate mornings. They should be illegal. I, I, I you know, if I was president, we would not have mornings. Mornings would be outlawed. <laughs> we wouldn't get up till noon. I don't like mornings, and I hated them even more back then when I was young, because I just tended to want to stay up all night. And so getting up at 5 o'clock every morning to go out in the freezing cold and run through snow took a lot. But I did it because I saw value and I wanted the results. That's what we've got to want. We've got to want the results this morning, or we're not going to do it. So I want to start in this message by talking a little bit about why is prayer so important. In your notes, why is prayer so important. Number one, because prayer is commanded in God's word. You say, well, why does that good, you know, why does that motivate me? Well, we should really understand that God says if you are a Christian, if you truly want, uh, you know, want to have a relationship with me, it is a requirement. You have to pray. The Bible says that we cannot please God if we don't pray. In fact, it, it tells us that if we, if, if we love him, we will be obedient to him. He commands us to pray. In Philippians 4, 6, and 7, he says, don't worry about anything. Instead, what? Pray about everything. He doesn't say, here's an alternative. If you decide you shouldn't, you know, you don't want to worry anymore, you could go ahead and pray. No, no, it is a command. He says, don't worry. Instead, pray. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you, will, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16-18, he gives us a little bit of an idea of his will for our life. And what does he say? Always be joyful. You know, that's a command, by the way. Just a little side note. He tells us to be joyful. You know why? Because joy is a choice. We can choose to be depressed, we can choose to be anxious, we can choose to be mad, and we can also choose to have joy. He says, always be joyful, never stop praying. Now, it doesn't even say, you know, pray for 15 minutes a day. Never stop. Pray without ceasing. What does that mean? That means constantly being in communion with God. Being in a prayerful attitude and mode all day long. Be thankful in all circumstances. So he gives us three things. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances. And then he says, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. You want to know what God's will for you? Well, there's three things right there. Be joyful. No anxiety. No depression. No fear. Be joyful. Never stop praying. Pray all the time. And number three, be thankful in all circumstances. So it's commanded. Number two, prayer is mod uh, modeled by Jesus. Think about this. Jesus, God's son, who was very God, in fact, who was, uh, who was completely God and completely human. John, first, uh, John chapter 1 tells us that nothing was formed without Jesus' hands. He was the creator. He was the component of of the Holy Trinity that created everything. And he felt the need to pray. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. He got away from everything and he prayed with his to his Father. 
Now, if Jesus needed to pray, how much more do we need to pray? It is in, it, 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 it's, it's a need. It's, it's something that not only we're commanded to do, but we need to do it. And Jesus said, it's so important, I'm going to model it. Because I want you to do what I have done. I did what I see the Father doing. I want you to do what you see me doing. Number three, prayer is one important way I commune with God. If, if I'm not praying every day, then I can't really say that I'm communing with God. And if I'm not communing, what do I mean by communing? I mean spending time building the relationship, abiding in the vine, hanging, excuse me, hanging out with him. If I'm not praying, chances are I'm not really communing with him because that is one of the primary ways. Prayer and time in his word are, you know, two of the big ways. And then, of course, being in his presence with the church family, that's one way. Being in his presence in a Bible study, that's one way. But I can only do that once or twice a week. If I'm going to commune with God, prayer is like one of the main ways. And John 15, 4 through 7 says, Remain in me and I, rem I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away uh, like useless branch and withers. Such branch, branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask anything you want and it will be granted. Notice how he's connecting abiding with the vine and asking. Because one of the primary ways that we commune with God is in prayer. And he says, if you commune with me and you abide in me, you can pray for anything you want, and it'll be done. Because see, I'm going to bend your will to mine. As we commune, I'm going to pull you closer to me. I'm going to show you my character, and I'm going to rub off on you. And your desires are going to be, they're going to line up with my desires. And therefore, anything you desire, you're going to pray for, and you're going to get it. Because you and me are thinking the same way. And we're wanting the same things. And if we are not wanting the same things that God wants, if you don't desire for people to be saved as much as God does, the reason is, is you're not communing with him. Not that we're ever going to want it as much as he does. But if we don't, if we don't want to spend the majority of our time evangelizing, it's because we're not abiding in the vine. Because when you abide in the vine, you begin to want the same things he wants. And that's an important, uh, uh, that's an important thing for us to understand. So prayer, why is it important? God commands it. Jesus modeled it, and prayer is one of the most important ways that we commune with God. Number four, prayer is one way we prove and grow our faith in God. I believe that prayer, more than any other thing we can do, is a sign of our faith, that it grows our faith or it shows that we don't have any. Why? And again, I've talked about it before. Sure, you can tithe, and yes, you should tithe. But you know what? I can get money back. And that's pretty easy for me to reach in my pocket and put some money in there because I know, well, even if I'm behind, you know, I can get it back. But time, I can't get back. So when I waste, and I put that in quotes, waste a bunch of time in my prayer closet hanging out with God, there's no way I'm going to do that unless I truly believe he's there with me and that he's going to respond. Right? It takes a step of faith that... To me, tithing doesn't require. That's why those are the two biggest areas. We need to be doing these two things. Tithing, praying. Those are two ways that we show that we truly trust God. And if we do not pray, what does it say? It says, I don't see value in it. I don't believe God will answer. I don't trust him with my problems. I trust me with my problems. That's what we're really saying. I'd rather take care of my own life than to trust him. You know, we did this song a couple of weeks in a row. In fact, we're doing it next week, and Jason asked me, we're doing that song three weeks in a row? Yes, we are. Number one, it's a new song. Number two, it goes with this series. The battle belongs to the Lord. I love the way that chorus starts. When I, when I fight, I will fight on my knees. And that, we're in a fight. We are in a fight. We don't see it that way. But it is a spiritual war. 
You know what's going on right now? All the unrest in the, the capital. It's, it's this has been going on for years. This is nothing new. It's not against it, it's not the the Democrats against the Republicans. It's not left against right. It's good versus evil. That's just what it is. And it's been going on for years. In every king and every with every king and every kingdom, every president, every world leader, there's a battle going on, and the enemy wants to take us out. He wants to take us away from the Lord. And let me tell you something, our country is going off the rails and it's getting farther and farther from the Lord. And what, what can we do about it? We can make big change. Maybe not nationally, but certainly in our area. By doing what? Praying. By praying. By saying, God, I trust you that I'm not wasting my time. That when I'm here in my prayer closet, it's just not me ministering to myself. But I'm here. I'm two steps of faith. God is going to commune with you. And you are going to experience his presence like you never have. You know, last night, um, I don't mean to rob... Hannah of her <laughs> of her uh, God sighting, but I use her all the time. In fact, my boss got me a cup, a mug this year for Christmas, and it says simply, warning, pastor in the area, anything you do or say may be used in a sermon. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and Hannah's a good sport, so I pick on her because I don't want to pick on you because you won't come, but she has to come right now. She does. <laughs> What was I going to say? Yes. Anyway, last night we're talking and she said, you know, all these, these goofy apps are just, they're not working. You know, I just, I don't understand. You know, and, and she's like, you know, I, I gave all this money and now they won't give it back and it's stupid. And I'm like, I said, well, what is the most important thing you should do? And she's like, you know what, call for my money back, uh, get on a new app, whatever, have more dates. And I said, no, it's what we're talking about tomorrow. Just pray. She's like, well, yeah. <laughs> but you know what happened? It's, it sounds to me like, and I didn't know this till just when I heard it, I heard it with you, you know, that she decided that she was going to really pray. And guess what happens? When you reach out in faith, God responds. And it increases your faith. Because I don't know about you, but, you know, there's been times that it, it's, you know, it's like my prayers just don't go anywhere. I remember being out there, you know, in Germany in the grapevines. It used to be my favorite place to pray. But sometimes it'd be like, man, I just feel like I'm talking to myself. And it's, God understands that, so it's okay. You know, let him know how you feel. And you know what? It was then, during those times, that I just kept pressing in and pressing in. And before you know it, God would speak to me in such a radical way. I remember there was a couple of weeks that I was just really frustrated and I'm like, God, I just, I want this, I want that, you know, whatever. And in fact, a lot of it was revolved around a girl. Imagine that. You know, a buddy of mine and I were kind of fighting over this girl, and we both didn't want to date military girls, you know, because there, there was like a whole stigma. We just didn't want to do that at the time. And now this girl comes in, and she's got this cute voice, and she's cute, and she was a Christian. And that's almost unheard of, you know. In our era, we didn't know any Christian women in the military. And so... My buddy started going out with her first, and I was like, yeah. But then it didn't work out. I'm like, ooh, I still got my chance. So I started to go out with her. I'm like, yeah. But during that time that he was going out, I was praying to God. You know, God, I, you know, I don't want to be mean. You know, and I, I want my friend to be happy too. And, you know, but at the same time, God, why? And I wasn't hearing God. And I remember being out in the grapevines, you know, and, and if you know anything about grapevines, in, in Germany, all cities are pretty much built in the valley. And they're, they're you know, mountains on all sides, not necessarily mountains, but large hills. <laughs> and so when I talk about uh, prayer, and they always put grapevines, that's where all the grapes are, on the hills. And when you run, we would go running for, on the, in, in the grapevines, it was like, wow, what a torturous run that is uphill. But I used to go up to the top because you could see the city. And what an awesome view for prayer, right? And plus, nobody's out there. So you just kind of hang out, and you could just wander through the vines, you know, and pray. And I felt like I was abiding in the vine, right? No, but I'm, shh. Okay, oh, you guys are sick. You guys are awake. Anyway, so, uh, you know, here I am in the vine. and Yes, exactly. I'm in the vines. I'm praying, and I just felt like, you know, God, why aren't you talking back? Why is it that I don't feel you talking? And you know what? I started dating this gal, and I'm, I remember being in uh, my, uh, you know, in my rig, my, you know, where I did my business there in the military. It was the back. It was called a van that sits on the back of your truck and held my communication gear in there. 
And I'm in there, and God spoke to me so clearly. I've never felt him speak to me at that point so clearly. And he said, I don't want you to go out with this girl. And I'm like, are you serious? All this asking and wanting you to speak to me, and this is what you have to say to me? But you know, the beauty was, I didn't like what he had to say, but what I did like is the fact that it was him, and I knew it was him. And in fact, as I tried to ignore and pretend it wasn't his voice, it, God's Holy Spirit just rose up in me and was like, you can't run from this. You need to understand this is my voice. And I remember going into a room and saying, man, I, you know, I, I feel like kind of dumb, but you know, here I've been waiting, you know, pining over you, trying to get you to go out with me, and now we're going out and you know, kind of going steady in the vernacular of the day. And now I had to go into a room and say, God told me I shouldn't. <laughs> you know, boy, that, that really makes you look wonderful, right? But, you know, luckily she was a Christian. She said, you know, I get it. She said I would do the same thing. And she understood, and it was cool. And even though it was bad that I didn't get what I wanted, what I really needed was to hear God's voice, and he gave me that. And let me tell you something. When you sacrifice your time and you get on your knees... You might not always get all the answers that you want, but what you are going to get is his voice. And he's going to talk to you and commune, to you, commune with you, and you're going to get to trust his voice. Because the problem with God's voice is it's often in our, well, his, when he communicates, we hear it in our voice, right? In our head. And so it's hard to say, well, is that just a thought I'm having? Is that just, I ate too much, you know, spice before bed? You know, what, what's the deal here? Is this really God? And he begins to show you his voice, and you begin to trust that. And then as you trust that, you do things that you wouldn't normally do, and you see big results. And that step of faith leads to huge, huge things in your life. And that is what I want for all of us in 2021. Prayer, it proves and it grows my faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, so you see it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that there is a God and that he rewards those who what? Who sincerely seek him. That's what we need to do. We need to get on our knees and seek him. That's more important than even the answers to our prayers. Just seeking more of him. You say, well, I don't need to seek him. I already know him. Do you? Do you have all of him? Do you know everything about him? Are you communing, communing with him? Do you have a deep, deep relationship you ever, you ever see an old couple? Just an old couple who have been married for like a thousand years. And they're just, you know, old, frail. They can't do the sexual things that we, you know, that made us attracted to our mates, right, when we were young. But yet you see the look they have for each other in their eyes. And you realize, wow, that now that's love. That's love. And if one of them dies, the other is sure to follow soon because they just... It's like, man, I can't go on living without my so-and-so, right? That's what, that's what happens when you commune together for years. And that's what's going to happen to us as we commune with God. We're going to get closer and closer and closer. And he's going to be, we're going to be, we're going to get to the point where I just can't live without being in his presence. Number five. Prayer is one way I grow my love for God. And again, that's what we just talked about. As I commune with him, that's the only way I'm going to grow in love. When you're dating someone, how do you grow in love for them? Not by looking at their picture, not by thinking about them, but by doing what? Hanging out with them, communicating, sharing your heart. They share their heart. You get to know them. They get to know you. You develop a bond. And you commune. And you, you develop an emotional attachment, a spiritual attachment. That's how we grow our love for one another. Yet sometimes we just come here and we learn about God. And that's wonderful to know about God. But, you know, it's, it's, you get on a, a you know, Christian mingle or whatever your website and you're dating. And, and you see all about this person. You, read, you can read and know all about them. If they're honest. <laughs> but then, when you start to date them, it changes, doesn't it? You get to know the real them. You, you, you know, it's, it's more intimate. You know, it's not enough to know about God. 
He wants you to experience his love. That takes time. We can't necessarily do that in church. We learn about God sometimes. But if we want to commune with him and grow love for him and experience his love the way the Bible tells us to, it's going to take prayer. We're going to have to do it on our knees. John chapter... Oh, I flipped my page here. Now I've lost it. Let's go back down where I was here. Okay. John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, obey my commandments. So first of all, he's saying, if you love me, obey my commandments. And one of my commandments to you is to pray. Well, then the opposite is also true. As we pray, we will learn to appreciate him more and more. Matthew 6, 20 through 21 says, store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will, also, will be also. Do you treasure the Lord? Do you treasure your time with him? Do you treasure your half hour, hour, whatever time you spend in prayer? Do you treasure that above everything else? If you don't, you probably haven't been in prayer long enough. You haven't, you haven't broken that threshold. You see, we can do 15 minutes a day without even any faith, you know? I'll give it 15 minutes here. Okay, God, give me this, give me this, read some Bible, you know, drink some coffee, and then we're on our way. I'll give him that. But you know, when we start to push the clock and we start to give him a half hour, an hour a day, we start to pray, pray without ceasing. We turn the radio off in the car and we start to pray in the car. We get up early instead of just praying in the shower or praying while we eat. You know, getting up early and going into our prayer closet or prayer room or whatever and getting on our knees and really giving the sacrifice to him. When we start to do that, it pushes that threshold. And it, 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 it changes our heart. And he rubs off onto us and we begin to really see value. You see, it, again, it's a faith thing. It takes faith to do it, but when we do it, it grows our love for him. It lets us experience his love. When's the last time you've experienced the love of God? You know, Paul told the, the church in Ephesus, he said, I pray that you would experience God's love. You're never going to fully understand it, but we'll, we'll, if you would experience it, then you'll be full and complete and able to do everything that God wants you to do. When's the last time you experienced his love? How are you going to do that? It's going to be through prayer, through communing with him. We grow our love for other people by spending time with them. We grow our love with God, or for God, by spending time with him. Number six, prayer is one way I receive direction. I receive God's direction. So, you know, the Bible says in uh, Psalm 32, 8, the Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. And we think, man, that's good. That's good. God is going to guide me. He's going to uh, take me along the best pathway. Not a good one, not an okay one, not the one that I would choose, but he's going to show me the best pathway. And we, we think, man, that's a pretty good deal, you know? I mean, there's a lot of people out there that I could pay a lot. I have to pay a lot of money to get on a good path. He's going to advise me and put me on the best path. And we're excited about that. But you know what we're not, we're not always willing to do? Spend the time in prayer so that he can tell us. See, how is God going to guide us if we aren't used to listening to him and hear his voice? How can he guide us if we're not slowing down, stopping long enough, being quiet before the Lord and letting him tell us? How are we going to get that guidance? Now, I'm not saying the word. The word certainly gives us guidance and he can guide us through his word. But those are God's general marching orders. So, and I've used this example before. He might say, I want you to go make disciples. Great. So, if I don't know specifically what to do, I need to go to the Word. What does He want me to do with my day to day? He wants me to make disciples. Okay. So, I go out and make disciples and I start talking to people. But when I learn to hear God's voice, He leads me to people that I would never otherwise go to. He leads me to people who are hungry, who are ready. He makes my time more productive. That's not going to happen if we're not listening to him. And the only way we're going to grow in our ability to do that is to develop that relationship. And, and the only way we're going to do that is through prayer. James chapter 1, verse 5. Again, same, same topic here. If you need wisdom. In other words, if you want to know what God wants you to do, what do we do? 
Ask your generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Well, what, what's another way of saying this? If you don't ask him, you won't get his wisdom, right? You have not because you ask not. That's what he's saying here. So he's saying, if you want wisdom, if you want my guidance, if you want to know what the best pathway is for your life, you got to ask. And then you've got to shut up long enough so I can tell you. And you got to give me time to do that. Number seven. I keep flipping my screen. Prayer is one way I build and maintain proper perspective. The fact is, is that we are prideful people and Satan loves to instigate our pride. Doesn't he? One of the biggest ways, because one of, what is one of the biggest sins of Satan? Pride. It's one of the biggest ones. It's what got him kicked out of heaven. Pride. I don't need to do it your way. I'm powerful. I'm, not, I'm good on my own. It's how he appealed to Eve. Hey, you eat this fruit? It's not only delicious, <laughs> but you will be like God. Then we good and evil. Ooh, like God. I like the sound of that. You see, he's always, he loves to work on our pride. I don't need God. I don't need anybody. I can do this on my own. I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I can make this happen. And you know, when we are prideful, we are not getting anything from God. God, God rewards those who are humble, who know their need for him. In fact, the Bible says blessed are those who are poor in spirit, those who recognize their need for God. That's how we see power in our life. When we pray, God aligns our perspective and we understand that he is God and that we can't do it without him. He also gives us perspective that with him, we can do it, that there's nothing that can defeat us if he wants us to win. You see? That's the perspective. Psalm 5.2 says, Listen to my cry for help, my king, and my God, for I pray to no one but you. See, David understood that God was God, and that he says, I pray to you because you are the only one worthy to pray to. You are the only way I'm going to survive. You are the only one who can truly help me. He said, I pray to you because you are my king and my God. James 4, 6-7 reminds us God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourself before God. One of the ways that we humble ourselves is getting on our knees before him. In fact, you know, we don't often get on our knees anymore. You know, there's something humbling about that. You know, when we get down on our knees. You know, sometimes you'll see me do that during worship. I'd love to see more of you join me in these physical expressions of, of worship. There's something humbling about it. Getting down on our knees, you know that's the way. That's the way that the, the, the you know the, the the common folk used to, you know, address kings. If you went up before a king or somebody in royalty, you know, you would bow down before them. You know, we don't do that anymore, and I'm glad we don't have to do that before the you know run run into the mayor in Pickerington. <laughs> you know, have to bow down. But you know, we should do it when it comes to God, because there's something humbling about it. It's a physical expression of humility. You know, just like raising our hands. You know what I, what I picture when I raise my hands? You know, some of you might think I'm a, an idiot, you know, or I'm just trying to be showy. No. You know what I'm doing? Because I do it in my backyard, and I don't want anybody to see. When I'm mowing my lawn, and I'm worshiping, and I'm afraid the neighbors might look and say, look at this idiot out in his lawn. What's he doing? Praying for rain? You know? <laughs> what, what am I doing? It's like a little child. Pick me up, Daddy. Pick me up, Mommy. That's the way I look at it. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a posture of humility. God says, I want you to have the right perspective because in your weakness, I am strong. But in your strength, you're weak <laughs> because I'm not going to help you. So prayer, very important. And then finally, and one of the most important, well, I wouldn't say the most important one, but the one that might kind of get our attention the most, I may not get what I need if I don't ask. Now, I say may, because sometimes God gives us what we need even when we don't ask. Sometimes, luckily, you know, and I know luck has nothing to do with it, but, you know, because of other people, sometimes people praying for us gets us what we need. You know, remember Brandon the other day said that he prayed for an atheist who had a hand issue and she was healed? 
Well, it wasn't her faith, right? It wasn't her faith that healed her. It wasn't her, you know, relationship with God. It was the relationship with those men praying and men and women praying over them, over her. And so we need to understand, sometimes we get good things just because it happens, okay? Because we are blessed because of other people. We're blessed because people are praying for us. There's all kinds of reasons. You know, even atheists sometimes have good things happen in this life. But I may not get what I want if I don't ask. The Bible tells us that. James 4, 2 comes right out and says, Yet you don't have what you want because what? Because you don't ask God for it. So, you know, sometimes God just says, You know what? I'm not giving you what you want until you pray. There's been many times in my life where I have worked and worked and slaved, and it wasn't until I got down on my knees and prayed that God did something about it. I told you that a few, maybe it was last week, week before, about the time when I was, you know, had this issue of work. I just, it was racking my brain. I was spending weeks trying to go, you know, solve this problem. And it wasn't until I broke down and prayed when God reminded me, he said, you know, you've been blowing me off on this whole issue. Why don't you pray about it? Well, you don't care about this stuff. What? I don't what? <laughs> I'm like, okay, I guess you do care. And I prayed, and before I entered the building that morning, I had the answer. God gave it to me. It didn't come, it didn't come until I asked. And there's a lot of things. You know, I, I, you know you've heard the story of uh, you know, the guy who, who dies and he goes to heaven, and he sees all these warehouses just everywhere in heaven. He's like, what are those warehouses? Peter says, come on here, I'll show you. And they go over to a warehouse and they look inside and there's all these wonderful things. Just new houses, you know, just new cars, better job. I don't know how you house a job, but you know, this is, this is a story, right? So basically all these things. And there's just where, and he says, what are these things? He said, these are prayers that never got prayed. These are God's blessing that he wanted to give out, but people didn't ask. In fact, I think the way the story goes that uh, he went over to one of them, there was a tag on him that said, never ask for. I think that's how the story goes. You know, and I just feel like there's so many things that we don't have because we don't ask. Hannah asked me last night, she goes, but I prayed. And I said, yeah, but have you prayed persistently? You see, God said, I don't want you to just pray once. In fact, if we just pray once for something, what does that tell you? You must not want it very much, do you? If, it ain't, if it's not more important than that, why would God ever waste his time? You know, I, I've said, I've told this before, but I'll, I'll reiterate for you've heard this. I'm sorry. But, you know, when, you, when it's Christmas time and your kids, you know, young kids especially, especially when I was a kid, there was, we had these catalogs. They don't have those anymore. Now it's all online. But we had, like, the, what, the Sears catalog, the Montgomery Wards catalog, and the J.C. Penney catalog. All three of those we had, and they were about that thick. And we used to sit there and look at something, and we'd circle, and we'd write down all the things we wanted. And it just, you know, we'd go to mom and dad, you know, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. Well, you know what? As a parent, you realize, number one, you can't buy all those things. It's not good for them, and you don't have the money to get them all that stuff. So what do you do? How do you find out what they really want? You wait and see how many times they ask for different things. Over time, what they're going to do, they're not going to ask for all those things. They're going to hone in on the things they really want. And they're going to keep asking for those things. And it's going to keep coming up in conversation. And now you know what to get them. And you know what? I think sometimes God's the same way. He's like, you know, they're asking for stuff all the time and they ask for it one time. I don't think they really want that. And so I'm going to wait and see what's really important to them. And so I told her, I said, I think you should pray about it until you get an answer. And if that's 360 times, 360, if it's two, three, four years, and you pray for it every day, it'll be worth it, wouldn't it? Absolutely. So pray persistently. But here's what I do know. If we don't ask, we're probably not going to get it. All right. So why should I pray? Well, because prayer is commanded in God's word. It was modeled by Jesus. It's one of the most important ways I commune with God. It's one of the ways that I prove and grow my faith in God. Prayer is one way I prove and grow my love for God. It's the way I receive God's direction. It's one way I build and maintain proper perspective, which keeps me in line with God. And then finally, I may not get what I want if I don't ask. 
Now, with that being said, the question that I want to answer now is simply this. How, uh, I just lost my place again. There we go. How can I build a rich and consistent prayer life? How can I build a prayer life that makes, that, that increases my faith, increases my love for God, allows me to have a, a true relationship with Him? How can I move out of religion? You see, religion is, you know, uh, God, what, 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 you know, it, it, religion is, is uh, good God, or good food, good meat, good God, let's eat. <laughs> religion is, uh, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, and if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take, amen. That's religion. We're just, it's like, it's like an incantation. It's not even, you know, we're not, there's no meaning in it. Even sometimes when we, pre when we repeat the Lord's Prayer, I don't think Jesus really intended for us to pray his exact words. Because that becomes like a rote prayer. It becomes something that's meaningless. It, 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 it's void. He, he was giving us a, a, a model. Start off with worship. You know, and praise. Ask him to meet your needs. Pray for other people. Pray for forgiveness of your sins. You know, those sorts of things. And so, we're going to we're gonna have to build a rich and meaningful prayer life that drives us to our needs, that pushes past religion so that it doesn't feel like, yeah, I'm just getting my check mark. Because you know what? God doesn't get check marks. He wants a relationship with us. He doesn't want us to, to oh, they prayed before bed. Good job. Oh, they prayed before dinner. Great. They're good for today. Now he wants a relationship. So how do I do this? I'm going to give you a few ideas this morning. Number one, create a war room, or in other words, find a space. I use war room because, you know, we talked about that, you know, several times. We've probably all seen the movie War Room, where the lady, you know, has this place where she goes and she has all these sticky notes and whatever. You know, we need a place where we can go to get away from everything. The Bible says in Luke 5, 16, we read it earlier, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. What did he what did he withdraw from? Everyone else. Stuff, things, noise, relationships with other people. He pulled away from everything and he went and got off by himself so that he could be focused and give God his undivided attention. Do we do that? Yeah, I pray, I ask people all the time, do you pray? Yeah, I pray in the car every day. You know what? God doesn't have your undivided attention. You know, I pray. I pray when I get up. You know, I, I go in while I'm showering. I pray. It doesn't have your undivided attention then. You know, I pray, you know, right before I eat. <laughs> he doesn't really have your undivided attention then. You're thinking about food. You've got to make it quick because otherwise your food gets cold. <laughs> it's not, there's nothing wrong with praying and thanking God for your food. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that there's got to be more than that. So you've got to find a place where you can do just what Jesus did. Withdraw from your family. Withdraw from your phone. Withdraw from your TV, from your Xbox, from people, from everything. And go someplace. Here's the key in your notes. Find a place where I can have undivided, or uninterrupted, I'm sorry, uninterrupted silence. Where God can have my undivided attention. Your spouse should not be around. Your kids should not be around. Now, I know, moms, you're going to have struggles with this if you're a stay-home mom or dads if you're a stay-home dad. You're going to have trouble with this because you're never away from them. Well, you might have to pick a time when your spouse is home and you can get away. Or you can be like that lady, I can't remember, it was one of like one of the great theologians of history, his wife. She, they had a bunch of kids and she never could get away, so she used to take her dress. Now, this is back in the days where they had like, you know, the leg thing. I don't know what you call those, the bloomers or what. What's the thing that you wear, the leg... They're not leggings, but you know those things they used to wear on their legs, and then they would have a slip, and then they would have the dress, and she pulled the dress, and left the slip, and all the other stuff, and she would pull it up over her head like a tent. She said, when mommy's doing this, do not bother her, she's praying. <laughs> and that was the way she got away from her children. But the kids knew, if mommy's doing that, don't you dare come talk to me, because me and Jesus are hanging out right now. But you got to find a place. And it's better if the kids aren't there. It's better if you can go find a place where you can go get away. And maybe it's when the kids have their nap. 
You know, you put them down, and then you go. But find a place where you can have uninterrupted silence. Maybe this week, the challenge is for some of you to find that place, you know? Not in the chair out in the middle where everybody else is at, but find a place. Maybe a closet. You know, remember the, the War Room movie? She actually emptied out a closet and made it her prayer room, and she put little sticky notes and things that, you know, kind of and made a big space, took out all the clothes. You know, if you're really serious about it, maybe that wouldn't be a bad idea if you've got the space. Maybe make a little corner of your basement, put up a little curtain, you know. You can make a PVC pipe curtain, you know, just like I did. You know, that's just like your prayer place, you know. It's kind of, it's kind of like a mental thing for us, too. It's, it's not a bad thing, you know. Go in and have a little, you know, have some visuals that help you to get focused, maybe cross, I don't know. You know, something that helps you to get in God's presence. Have a Bible there, maybe a little radio with some, this you can put on some worship music, real silent or something. You know, maybe just a, I don't know, it's, it's going to be different for everybody, but find a place where you can pray and make that your place. Number two, schedule daily prayer time. If you don't plan it, it probably won't happen. Because we here's what we say, well, you know, if I have time at the end of the day, I'm going to pray. You know what that means? I'm not going to pray. That's pretty much what that means. If we don't have a plan, you know, you plan to go to work. You don't just, uh, in fact, uh, how many of you set alarms in the morning to go to work? <laughs> Pretty much all of us, right? Why? Because we plan to go to work. No, most of us just don't leave our alarms off and say, well, if I wake up and I feel like it, I'll, I'll go ahead and go on into work. No, they kind of require us to do that, right? So if you plan to go to work, why wouldn't you plan to have time with the Lord? What's more important? Giving time to your boss or spending time in God's presence? I think spending time in God's presence is the most important thing we do every day. Why is it in our schedule? Why is it in our planner? We put other things in our planner that are very, very much not, I'm saying that wrong, uh, that are not nearly as important. That's what I wanted to say. The Bible says this in Ephesians 5, so be careful how you live. I mean, we, you can do a whole sermon on that, right? Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. What does the Lord want you to do? Pray. He wants you to be on your knees in prayer. You have to schedule it. Scheduling it means that it won't it won't get knocked off because of, I mean, I'm not saying that sometimes there's not emergencies. Hey, if there's an emergency, you might not go to work, right? Even though it's on your schedule. If there's an emergency, you might, you know, change everything. But for the most part, we tend to do what we have scheduled. Why don't we schedule time? That way we know it's going to happen. You know, from 8 to 9 in the morning, before I do anything, I'm going to spend time with God. For some of you, it's going to be uglier. From 5 to 6 in the morning, I'm going to spend time with God. It's going to stink getting up early. If you're like me, ugh. <laughs> but I think God's worth it. And I know some of you say, well, maybe I'll pray in the evening. Hey, if that's the what you have to do, then do it. But I would I would venture to say it's really important to get it at least sometime in the morning. Because it gets your head together. You know, I don't get dressed at the end of the day. I don't fix my hair at the end of the day. I do it at the beginning of the day to prepare to go into the world. Don't I need to pray to get ready to enter the world? Sometimes we come to church and we don't hear from God. We don't connect with him and we leave thinking, man, that was a waste. Why do you suppose that happens sometimes? Is it because the services are no good? Probably not. I don't care where you go. Because if I, if you go someplace and tend to hear from God, you know what I believe? You're going to hear from God. It doesn't matter what the person's saying. It doesn't matter if I'm having an off day. God never has an off day. And you can hear from him. In fact, the most important things you I'm saying, but the things that God is speaking to you directly about that I don't even know about. Because he's God, he can do that. And so, uh, I got off track again. Where was I heading with that? Schedule. Why was I, what was I talking about before that? Somebody back me up. Anybody? Well, that's not exactly what I was at, <laughs> but that'll work. <laughs> go, when in doubt, go right back to the main point. The fact is, is if we don't schedule it, it's probably not going to happen. And we need to schedule that time and we need to be consistent with it as much as we can. Number three, maintain a prayer list and prayer journal. This is vital. This is vital. You say, well, there's no place in the Bible that says 
you need to have a prayer list. You are right. There is no place in the Bible that says I need a prayer list. There's no place where I need to that says I need to journal. But here's what the Bible does say. It says that I need to pray for all people everywhere. It says that I need to remember what God has done. How am I going to do that? I was thinking about this this morning when I was a kid, when I was a kid, when I was younger, I was a worship leader in the church that sits right across the street, Sycamore. And I remember uh, writing a song on the piano. I don't really play piano, but I, you know, I mean, I can, if I, you know, learn. I used to play in a band when I was real young, and I used to play bass and keyboard. I thought it was Getty Lee from Rush, you know. I'd be like, and I'd go to a chorus, and I'd do this, you know. And I'd play bass notes along with it and stuff. And uh, anyway, but I, I wrote this song that I called Hannah's Song. And I was just thinking this morning. I don't know what made me think of it, but I realized I don't remember that. I literally don't remember. And I played it. In fact, I used to play it um, when, uh, when uh, this, the, uh, if anybody was speaking besides me, whenever we got to the commitment time, I would always go back, and that's one of the songs that was my fallback song. And I would play it on the piano. And I'm just thinking, I don't remember it at all. I couldn't even think of how it went in my head. <laughs> now, you say, well, you're getting old. Well, yeah, that's part of it. <laughs> But you know, that's the way we tend to be, right? You, do you remember everything that you did in your childhood? No. Do you remember everything? Do you remember everything that you got for, your, for, your, for Christmas when you were five years old? I don't. I don't remember anything when I was five years old right now. I mean, you know, I have some early memories, but I don't remember everything. We tend to forget things, don't we? It's just part of, part of life. But, when I, so, but the Bible says we need to remember what God has done. How do we remember that? We write it down. And then we go back and we look at it. So let's look at why we should keep a prayer list and a prayer journal. Why? Number one, it helps me define what I want. The first thing is it helps me define what I want. Because sometimes I go to God and I'm like, you know, I don't really know what I want. And I just start babbling, you know, and I start using rote prayers and, you know, God, you know, thanks for the day. And, you know, and we try to think of how the pastor prays or how the Bible study leader prays. And we just start praying like them. And we, you know, well, bless me, Lord. Really? What does that mean, you know? I mean, first of all, I want to know that God answers. How do I know that he answers if I'm just praying general things like, God, bless me, bless our family? Don't you want to pray a little more specifically? And you know what? That's what a prayer list does. It forces me to figure out what I want. And I'm reminded of a story in Mark chapter 10 where Jesus is, you know, he's gone around preaching, doing all this stuff. And uh, in verse 46, it says, Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, or Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet. Many of the people yelled at him, but he only shouted louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, Tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, Go. For your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see. And he followed Jesus down the road. And you say, what does that have to do with what you're talking about? What if Jesus were to show up here today? And he were to say, what do you want today? Many of us be like, uh, uh. It's like asking, you know, it's like when the kids ask me, what do you want for Christmas? Uh, I, let me think about it, <laughs> you know? And it took me weeks to even come up with any ideas, you know? I didn't know what I wanted. And you know what? We're like that sometimes. What do we really want? We don't even know. What if Jesus came here today? Would he, would he find us going, um, uh, uh, you know, I'll give you anything you want. Uh, uh, uh. When we write it down, it helps us define what we want. And it helps God sort through what we really, really want. Okay? Number two, it helps guide my prayers. I've heard people, even church leaders, who say, well, man, I just can't hardly pray more than 15 minutes because I run out of things to pray for. You don't have a list, my friend. Because if you have a prayer list and you keep a prayer list, 
you're going to have struggles getting through that prayer list in a week's time. Amen? Okay, anybody who keeps a prayer list, you know, you know I'm, ta I'm speaking the truth here. When you start keeping a list, and here's what the Bible says. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1-4. through 4, I urge you, first of all, to pray for what? All people. Well, there's a full order right there, right? Ask God to help them. Intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. Just that one prayer. How many people do you know right now who don't know the Lord? Dozens? Hundreds? If you don't know hundreds, you don't know anybody because they're, they're all around us. And if we're supposed to pray for them, how in the you know, you say, well, oh, we just sit down and say, oh, God, you know, all the lost, please save them. You know what? If you're not willing to know them by name, and, it, you know, maybe not by name, but, you know, that guy at the BP with the spiky hair that, that you know, has the axe, the foreign accent, you don't have to know their name. Or Steve, and I know it's Steve because he has it on his name tag, or he's wearing Steve shirt, one of the two, I don't know. <laughs> but we're going to call him Steve, but God knows who Steve is. You know, if we're not specifically naming people, does that show that we have any desire for their salvation? And if we're going to start praying for people by name, I don't know about you, but I don't have it up here to mem remember everything. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep a list. I'm going to keep a list, and I'm going to pray for them. And, and, and that list is going to grow. And then I'm going to start adding, you know, well, i got to pray. You know, man, our country's gone through. i got to pray for our new president. i got to pray for his team. I gotta pray for protection over this nation. You know, we're gonna start adding things, and pretty soon that list is gonna be huge. And that pleases God, but it's it, we're gonna have to write it down. We just gotta do it. If you aren't writing it down, you're saying it's just not that important to me. Because we tend to write down what's important. That's why I believe it's important to take notes in church. Because by not taking notes, we're just saying it's not that important to me. And quite honestly, I don't like that, you know, personally. I don't want to tell God it's not that important to me. So every time, you know, whenever Donald speaks, it literally Donald has spoke here with notes that he and I put together, together. Basically, I already knew what the entire message was. But if you watch me, I take notes. Why? Because it's not just what he says or what I was thinking. It's what God is going to say through him. It's what God is going to speak to me about. And by not writing it down, I'm saying, God, this isn't that important to me. And so I believe that our prayers are important. We ought to write it down. Plus, number three, it helps me remember what God says. Because remember, prayer is not just about you talking. It's about you talking and listening. Well, I don't know about you, and this is why it's so important to take notes. Because when God says something, don't you feel like that's important? And I want to remember what God says. So if, we're, if I'm in prayer and he tells me something... I want to write it down so I can remember it. You know, you, we write down what professors say when we're in school. Isn't what God says more important than what a professor says? Matthew chapter 4, verse 4 says, Jesus told him, and he was kind of arguing with Satan here. He says, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by what? by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He wasn't just speaking in riddles. Literally, the Bible says that every word that comes out of God's mouth is true and useful and worthy to pay attention to. We need the word of God, not just God's word, but what he tells us and what he says to us. We need that more than we need food, at least as much as we need food. Amen? And so therefore, when he speaks to us, we need to write it down. That's called journaling. Okay, I'm not saying, you know, keep a diary. You know, a lot of what we do during the day is useless. I'm just saying keep a journal of what God says when you're in the war room, when you're in prayer. Number four, it helps me, it helps remind me what God has done. Again, God says in Isaiah 46, 9, Remember the things I have done in the past, for I alone am God. I am God, and there is no one like me. Over and over, throughout the Old Testament and the New, we are told to remember what God has done. That's important. If we're going to remember what God has done in our life, we're going to have to write it down. Okay? Because otherwise, we're going to forget. 
just like Hannah's song. Sorry, Hannah, I forgot you too. You, you probably don't even remember it. I remember she she said, you wrote something for Brenda, you didn't write anything for me. I'm like, but I wrote Hannah's song, and she's like, oh. Now she doesn't even remember it existed. <laughs> I, wrote a, I wrote a goofy song for my nephews once, and, and just it was a goofy song. It was called Badawees and the Tubbin. They used to say that when they were a kid. They, all the time, they're, they're, every time I was there, their Game Boy something would die. What are you going to do now? Oh, there's Badawees and the Tubbin. You know? So, <laughs> so I, I just wrote this song called Badawees and the Tubbin. And they laughed, and they laughed. Mom and Dad laughed. I don't remember anything about that song right now. Just that it was called Badawees and the Tubbin. And I can't even say tub it. That's a hard word to say if you're not like two years old. But anyway, uh, I digress. <laughs> Moving along. The fact is we forget stuff, and if we write it down, we won't. So number one, find a place to meet with God. Number two, schedule it in your calendar. Okay? Number three, keep a prayer list and journal and keep it updated and mark off when God answers the prayers. Because then you can look back with joy and say, God... Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for all these answered prayers. Number four, learn to pray continually. This means I don't just, uh, you know, get on the horn with God, pray for a little while, say amen, and over and out, and I'll see you tomorrow. We pray, but then we sort of, you know, leave the cell phone on speaker. And we just walk around all day and just include him in our day. Learn to pray without ceasing. Learn to pray at all times. Pray in your car. Pray at work. Pray when you're struggling and you're depressed and you, you're, you don't know why. Pray when you have a problem in the workplace. Pray when there's a relational issue. Pray when there's traffic problems and you can't get to work. Pray all the time. Just in, He's there. He's there. We treat God as if he doesn't exist. You know what that's called? Practical atheism. We say that we believe there's a God, but then we act like he's not there. God is with us 24-7, yet we just turn our back to him and pretend that he doesn't exist. How we must hurt God's heart. How we must bring displeasure to him. Because he's there, and he's wanting us to reach out to him, and we just won't do it. We need to learn. Ephesians 6.18 says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. We need to learn not only to have time in our prayer room, but we need to include him in our entire day. And that's going to intensify the prayers that we have when we are quiet. The key here, this is all about focusing on God. It's all about focus. You say, well, I can't focus on God and work at the same time. Yes, you can. You are far better than you think you are at multitasking. We do it all the time. We do, don't we? I mean, come on. Since the, and since the uh, invention of the smartphone, we have learned to do like three and four things at a time. We drive and we text. Shouldn't do it, but we do it. You know? If you don't believe that, just watch people on 270. Tomorrow morning when you go to work, just watch them. And you'll see, I saw a guy yesterday, we're driving home from Hilliard, and this guy's like had his head buried in his lap. I'm like, how are you even seeing to drive? I don't even get it. I mean, he was really down. And then he lifts up and he's got his phone in his hand. I'm like, oh my goodness, dude. You know, we I've seen kids almost walk into traffic. You know, they're downtown. Downtown's bad. You go downtown and there's sidewalk and they're just gonna this the sidewalk and they just walk right out in the street and say, Oh, oh, maybe I should have done that. We're so we we learn to do a lot of things. Tell let me tell you something. You can live and connect with God at the same time. Okay? You can learn to pray without ceasing, but it means you focus on it. And you know, the fact is, we're supposed to do that anyway, right? Paul says one final thing. Think about those things. Fix your mind on things that are worthy of praise, those things that are good, those things that are excellent. He says, all day long, focus on what's good. What's better than God? What's a better thing to focus on? It's about focus, focusing on him throughout the day. It's going to change our life. But learn to pray continually. Number five, make repentance a part of my daily prayer life. One of the things that weakens our prayers is because we have mixed feelings. We have guilt. And it keeps us from, from praying. 
And 1 John 3, 21 through 22 says, Dear friends, if we don't feel guilty, we can come to God with bold confidence. What is the opposite of that? If we are guilty, we will not come to God with bold confidence. What does that mean? Our faith is weak, right? So he says, if you don't feel guilty, you can come to God with bold confidence, and, he will, and we will receive from him whatever we ask because we obey him and do the things that please him. When there is sin in our life, when we have taken care of that sin, it hinders our prayer life. So if you want to have a rich and full prayer life, you need to make daily repentance part of the plan. Where you say, God, you, you, you pray like David, God, look into my heart and, and, and tell me if there's any wicked way in me. Know me and, tell, and show me what I'm doing wrong so that, I might, so that I might repent and that I might get right with you and that I might not have any guilt. Because when I don't have guilt, what happens? I can pray boldly and what I ask will be answered. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from every wrong. We don't have to ever question that. He's going to do it. We just simply need to do it. So every day when we pray, don't just go to him and ask for things. Take some time to, to examine yourself and ask God, is there anything that's going on? If I treated somebody poorly, am I doing the wrong thing? Am I, you know, what is it? And then repent. And turn and, and, and say, God, I will do what you've asked me to do. And it's going to open up, it's going to open up a new avenue of prayer. And it's going to intensify your prayer life. Number six, don't just simply pray for my needs, but the needs of others. Make sure that you're focusing not just on you, but on your family, on your church, on the people in your community, on the country. Pray for things not just for you, but for others. First Timothy, again, we read this earlier. Chapter 2, verse 1, I urge you first to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by goodness, uh, godliness, rather, and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth. So pray for other people. Here's the key. Focus on my kingdom-building efforts. Focus on kingdom-building efforts. We sometimes just want to pray for what brings us pleasure, okay? But the Bible says in James 4, 2 through 3, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Sometimes we just want what will make our life better. What about other people? What about kingdom work? What about changing lives? What about making new disciples? That's where we are. The Bible says seek first the kingdom of God. That's the next prayer, or the next uh, uh, verse. Seek first his kingdom, Matthew 6, 22 says, and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you. God says don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about all these things that we typically pray for. Yes, it's better to, to pray than worry. But, you know, let's get your mind off that and seek first the kingdom of God. That means we ought to be praying for the advancement of his kingdom, for people to be saved, for the growth of your church. For the other people in your church, for their ministry gifts to be used in a major way. We need to pray those kind of prayers. And again, uh, when we abide in the vine, we're going to read the scripture again, but John 15. Remember it said, if you abide in the vine, you'll get what you want in prayer. Why? Because as we abide in the vine, we commune with him. God aligns our heart with his. And if we find that our prayers are all about me, 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 you haven't aligned your heart yet. You're not abiding in the vine. Start abiding in the vine, and pretty soon you're going to find that, you know, you're not praying about what you're eating and where you're living and what clothes you're going to wear and all that good stuff and your job. And you know what? You're going to be praying for, for his kingdom and for his kingdom come. You're going to be praying for people's lives who are hanging in the balance. When you see your prayers move in that direction, you know you've been abiding in the vine. And finally, number seven, thank God when he answers. One of the most important parts of prayer that we often ignore is just the thanksgiving. You know, we become like spoiled kids who just constantly go to mom and dad. But mom and dad, I want this. I need this. All the other kids at school have it. You're evil because you won't get it for me. You don't love me. 
And that's the way we are with God. God, you don't love me. I need this and you won't give it to me. I need this, I need this, I need this. And he's like, when's the last time you thanked me for what I have done for you? You're like spoiled brats. God says, thank me. Thank me. And so what do we do? We go through our prayer journals. And we see where he's answered prayer. And we take a look at all the things that he has. You know, I prayed it this morning, and I believe it's true. God, if he never answered another prayer, we would still spend eternity trying to pay him back for all he's done for us, and we'd never get close. He didn't know you were life, but he gave you one. He didn't know you to be in the most wealthy nation in the world, but he planted you here. He didn't owe you to send his son so that you might have eternal life. He didn't, you didn't owe, he didn't owe you any of that, but he did it because he loves you. And we need to thank him. Luke chapter 17, here's where I close. 17 verses 11 through 19 says this. And Jesus continued on, on toward Jerusalem. He reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered the village there, ten lepers stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, Go, show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he had been healed, came back to Jesus shouting, Praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, Stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. You know, here's ten men who got healed. And nine of them ran on. Woohoo! No more leprosy. And one guy came back and said, Thank you. Thank you. You know, he's the one who's, who God's going to answer the prayers. Right? Those who are thankful for what he has done. And remember, and I'm going to read this one more time. We read it earlier. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. And then what's it say? Thank him for all he has done. You see, that's part of the that's part of receiving peace. Because if we are not thankful, God is going to shut off the conduit. He's going to stop giving us our answered prayers. And so we need to not only refuse to worry, pray, tell him what we need, and then thank him for everything he's done. And now the result of all those together is that we will experience God's peace, which is far uh, exceeds anything we can understand and his peace will guard our hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus. We need to learn to be thankful. So what do we need to do? We need to, we need to find a place. Some of you don't have a place this morning. Where can you, where can you set a place that's just for you and God? You need to put it in your schedule. How many of you right now have prayer time in your schedule? Let's add it this week. Then you need to to start keeping a prayer journal. Do you have one? You can get a book. You can get a, you can, you know, you can get a prayer journal. You can use a notebook. You can, there's prayer journals that you can download on your phone. If you do that and you use your phone, the thing is, is to turn it off <laughs> when you go into your prayer time. Otherwise, you're going to be distracted. Put it on uh, air, airport, airplane mode, whatever, so that nothing comes through. You need to do all those things, Okay. You need to learn to pray continually. Make repentance a normal part of your prayer life. Ask for the needs of others. Focus on kingdom building uh, efforts. And then thank God continually. And if we do these things in the new year, I believe it's going to change our lives. And it's going to grow this church. And he's going to do even greater things. Let's bow our heads this morning. In a word of prayer before we uh, close up shop, I'm going to challenge you. I prayed about this last night, and I wasn't sure where to go with it. And honestly, my gut feeling was to, to really challenge us to, to find a place and to commit to spending an hour every day in prayer. I'm going to lighten it up because I don't want to, I don't want to not include people. And maybe for some of you, you haven't been praying at all. And so maybe uh, maybe an hour is a bit much. So what I'm what I felt led by the Spirit is to challenge us this morning. Starting today, 
not tomorrow, but starting today, I believe God is asking us to commit to a half hour of prayer every single day. Half hour of un uninterrupted prayer room, war room, get, it, get alone with him kind of prayer. Now, if you've been doing a half hour, then I, I would raise that challenge to an hour. Because, you know, we, we have not because we ask not. And trust me, you know, I know that we can, we, can, we can say, oh, I want to change this world. And, you know, so I want to get out there and do stuff. There's no more important part of what we do than getting on our knees. And we've got a couple. We've got to pray like it all depends on God and then work like it all depends on us. And that couple <coughs> is, is what provides power in our ministry. And see, we, we like to do the stuff, but we don't really want to commit that time. And I believe God is saying, I want to see your faith. I want to see your faith. Not just in giving 10% of your income. I want you to give me a half hour. And if you can, an hour every day. Where you literally, you lose that hour. It is an hour that you just spend with me. Or a half hour that you spend with me. And you don't use it for anything else. And yeah, you're going to go from a 24-hour day to a 23-hour day. But I believe the rewards are going to be tremendous. But that's the kind of faith we need to have. Right now, are you willing to commit? Will you say, I do, Lord? Lord, I'm going to find a place, I'm going to schedule it, and I'm going to spend a half hour every day with you moving forward. And I'm going to, in faith, wait and see what you do. If you're willing to do that, I want you to say yes to him right now, but also because I want to pray for you. Because I know the enemy is going to do everything in his power to try to stop that. I want you to write on your communication card this morning, I will. I will. In fact, if, you, if you're just committing to a half hour, I want you to just put, you know, one half. If you're already there at one half and you're committing to an hour, I want to pray for you too. And I want you to just put one hour. But one way or the other, we've got to, we, we've got to, we've got to start breaking through. We've got to just start breaking down some barriers. There's a lot of barriers out there. We've got to start asking God for everything we need. We've got to start pushing our faith, growing our love for him and taking pulling away from religion and moving to a relationship because that's what God desires strongly. See, we like religion because it's quick and easy. We go in, we do a couple Hail Marys, we, you know, we uh, cross our hearts and we bow down on our knees and we take communion and then the rest of the week's ours. That's religion. God says, I want a relationship and that takes time. Show me that you want a relationship with me. Right now, I'm going to give you a few minutes to say yes to God. And then I want you to mark it on your communication cards, and then I'm going to close this up in prayer. God this morning as we close up in prayer um, I just ask you to compel us to pray oh it's such an important part of this thing called Christianity it's important to our relationship with you but yet it's it's difficult it's probably the most difficult thing because we're literally giving up time that we could be doing something fun or something where we can see results immediately we have to defer and, and delay those results to spend time with you. Sometimes when we go into our prayer closets, we don't even feel like you're there. It feels dry. And we got to keep pressing in, like the widow. And just keep pressing in until we experience you. And that takes faith. So, Father, right now, I pray that you would compel us to spend a half hour each day, every one of us, because I know that if we will do this, it is going to change our families. 
It's going to change our life. It's going to change this church. It's going to change the community. It's going to give us more power because we've been living weak lives because we haven't been praying. We haven't been plugged into the vine. We've been trying to live as a grief out on the dry desert floor and we haven't been getting the nutrients we need from you. Lord, pick us up, put us on the vine. Help us to sacrifice that time. Give us the, the, the courage and the faith to do it. And Lord, I pray that as we do it, that you will, that you will have many two-way conversations with people this week. Just like you had with Hannah last night, that you would give us all those two-way conversations, that we would learn to hear your voice, that we would be able to act on your word more. And Father, that we would see the even greater things happening, happening over and over and over. Because that's what you told us. Father, I thank you for what you were about to do this week as we enter a new phase in our prayer life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give God a hand this morning. Thank you. Thank you, God, for being here. All right, before we close up, we've got a, a one more thing to do, and that is to